Welcome to the official companion podcast series to the Showmax original series, Catch Me a Killer. If you're just coming across this for the first time, you've got some catching up to do. So before listening to this, you should have watched the first three episodes of Catch Me a Killer on the Showmax platform, and you also need to listen to the first companion podcast episode. If you've already checked all those off your list, then welcome to the next installment of the Catch Me a Killer official companion podcast. In episode three of Catch Me a Killer, Mickey Pistorius is hunting two serial killers. One is David Selepe, and the other, at least in the series, is called Warren Barnes. And I'm going to start on that one, because in the True Crime South Africa podcast Facebook group, I've seen a ton of questions around this. If you googled Warren Barnes, and it didn't give you anything vaguely related to a South African serial killer, that's because it's a pseudonym. So, why would the production team use a pseudonym for a serial killer? Well, that's because the actual person who was convicted of these crimes, a man named Nolan Edwards, was actually acquitted of the crimes on appeal. That's why you would have also noticed that he only served five years of his sentence. Now, in serial killer cases, acquittals are extremely rare. An acquittal in law essentially means that the person has had the guilty verdict against them reversed and they are instead deemed to be not guilty in a legal sense. That last phrase is important because in a legal sense, can be impacted by many things. It can mean the appeal judges found that the evidence used to convict was insufficient, or that there were errors in the application of the law that caused the accused to have an unfair trial. In the case of Nolan Edwards, he was initially found guilty of the murder of three women. Joanna Nisi, who Edwards had originally confessed to killing in his home after she came to his door, he claims making sexual advances toward him. Situpugi Sibia and Beauty Maleka were the other two victims. He said that they were sex workers who he'd picked up and taken to a quarry where he'd killed them. Although all three women had clearly been raped, Edwards denied that he had raped them. DNA was found in the bodies of Sibia and Maleka, which matched Edwards. And unfortunately, the trial documents and the appeal documents are not publicly available. At least, I couldn't find them. So it's difficult to know the exact details of Edwards' successful appeal, but what we do know is that Edwards was acquitted on the murder of Joanna Mnisi based on a technical irregularity that had occurred during the trial. The acquittals for the other two murders are not explained. Considering the nature of the physical evidence against the accused in those two, besides his confession of course, which was his DNA inside their bodies, I can only assume that the appeal judges found that the prosecution had not solidly proven that the DNA did not get there solely from Edwards having interacted with the woman during a sex work transaction. The fact that he did confess and that confession was accepted in the initial trial makes me wonder whether perhaps there wasn't some technical reason that the confession could not be used as evidence. Now, due to the acquittal on a technical irregularity in theory, Edwards could be recharged for Joanna Mnisi's murder. What about double jeopardy, you say? Well, the rule of double jeopardy in South Africa is that an individual cannot be tried twice for the same crime with the same set of facts. However, because the evidence in Mnisi's case was not in question, and rather the procedure used to convict was, Edwards could still be charged with that murder again. So, essentially, and to be very clear, Nolan Edwards, according to South African law, 
has not been found guilty of the three murders involved in this case. And this is why the producers of Catch Me a Killer decided to use a pseudonym for the character, which is only fair. Another interesting aspect of that case was that during the trial, Edwards claimed that he had dissociative identity disorder, which was previously known as multiple personality disorder. Now, DRD is an incredibly rare diagnosis, so rare that the most recent study published says it's only diagnosed in about 1.5% of the global population. It is, however, also one of the most frequently misdiagnosed conditions. DID usually occurs when a person suffers severe trauma in their childhood and the person's identity splits into two or more identities to serve as a protection mechanism against trauma or abuse. These are not additional personalities, and that is something very important to understand. They are fragments of the person's original identity, which can be reintegrated back into the main identity. Most importantly, most people living with true DID are not aware of the other identities. When these identities step to the forefront, they will experience a fugue state, which sometimes manifests as periods of memory loss. When Edwards was originally arrested, he claimed he had a form of amnesia around the murders, but then went on to provide a full confession. In her book, Catch Me a Killer, Mickey Pistorius explains why it would not be possible, in her opinion, for Edwards to have been living with DID, and how also, in her opinion, it is not possible for any serial killer to have DID. The other case that appears in episode 3 is that of David Selepe. And that's another notorious case that ended strangely and still leaves us with unanswered questions today. Selepe was active at the same time and in some corresponding areas to Moses Sotole, yet another infamous South African serial killer from the 1990s. Moses Zatole and David Selepe's series were being investigated at the same time. We'll probably get more into Zatole's crimes later in the series, but Selepe and Zatole remain inextricably linked, because even today, it's difficult to say with exact certainty exactly which victims in the two series were killed by which man. When David Selepe was originally arrested after a tip-off on the 15th of December 1995, Mickey Pistorius had already done a profile for the Cleveland series, which he was suspected of committing, and it fit him perfectly. Selepe was actually arrested in Mozambique, where he fled after realizing that police were on his trail. Although Mickey had wanted to interview him, he was already providing a confession, and doing some pointing outs of scenes which had to take precedence, and unfortunately, due to the events which would follow, she would never get the chance to do that interview. The crimes that Selepe confessed to were not just in Cleveland, but also in Boxburg, Johannesburg and Pretoria, which means his crimes crossed over even more with Setole than originally thought. In his confession, he also claimed to have worked with other killers. He could only give police first names for those men, though, and they were never able to trace them. The geographic crossover aspect of this case is interesting, because geography is an important part of serial profiling. Serial killers will generally commit their crimes in areas they're familiar with and comfortable in. This is why we see these series so often happening in the same area, and the monikers given often include the name of that area. But if it was as simple as serial killers killing where they live, that would make profilers' jobs a lot easier. It's not that easy, though, 
because we're dealing with human psychology here, which is complex and not always predictable. Over the years, criminologists and other researchers in the field have come to understand that serial killers don't just select, kill, and dispose of victims in areas they live in. Sometimes, each stage of the act is done in a separate area. For instance, they may select and target their victim in one area, move the victims to a different area to kill them, and even dispose of the bodies in a third location. And none of those locations necessarily have to be where the offender actually lives. They just have to be comfortable there. And comfortable can mean many things. We're comfortable in the area we live in, but we can also be comfortable in an area we previously lived in, or where we grew up, or where our family lives, or even where we work. That makes things quite a bit more complicated. Thankfully, although this technology would not have been available to the Cleveland Serial Killer Squad, throughout the years, geographical profiling tools have been developed that help task teams and profilers to narrow down possible search areas once a series has been identified. This technique was developed by Canadian Kim Rossmer and Professor David Cantor, who is based at the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. By using the GPS coordinates of each crime in the series, and by using the knowledge we've gained over the years about the general habits of serial killers, one or more anchor points can be isolated within the comfort zone or zones. Once identified, this anchor point helps investigators to narrow down their canvassing and target their resources in a specific area. If additional information about the crimes is available, such as the times the victims were last seen, the time of death, or when a body was disposed of, this can further help to narrow down whether the comfort zone might be a work or dwelling place for the killer, if they're believed to be employed. In South Africa, we also need to take into account that a large percentage of our population do not have access to their own vehicles. This changes how far they're able to travel to source victims, whether they can move them to a second location, and also where they might dispose of the bodies of their victims, all impacting the geographic profiling process. So, as you can see, even today with the technology we have, when you have two serial killers operating in the same areas, with similar modus operandi and a similar victim profile, it's a pretty complex job to create an accurate profile. One can only imagine how much more complex it was back in the 1990s without access to such technology. But Mickey Pistorius's profile was very spot on. Just some of the many sections of Mickey's profile that fit Selepe included the killer would be in his late 20s or early 30s, the killer would be self-employed or have access to a lot of money, he would drive an expensive car, he would wear flashy clothes and jewellery, he would be socially adept, charming and consider himself a ladies' man, he would be married or had been married, he would frequent shabines and social gatherings. He would probably be involved in fraud or theft. He might boast about being a killer or play cat and mouse games with the detectives. He would be up to date on current events and follow coverage in the media. Selepe was a businessman and seemed to do very well for himself. He drove a Mercedes-Benz and dressed very well. He was also very charming and despite being married, seemed to have very many female acquaintances. David Selepe had previous convictions for fraud and gun smuggling. When he was arrested, Selepe had newspaper articles in the boot of his car about the series of murders for which he was arrested. The Selepe case would come to an unexpected and grinding halt, though, 
when during the course of one of the pointing outs of a scene, Selepe had picked up a stick and tried to attack one of the police officers, likely in an effort to escape again. The officer drew his weapon and shot Selepe, and the accused killer passed away shortly afterwards. When we look at the murder series that crossed over with Selepe's later in the Catch Me a Killer series, we'll see why, even today, questions remain about whether Selepe and Sitole knew each other, and whether they actually worked as a pair at some point. And that is your companion podcast for the week. I'll bet that you, like me, are waiting with bated breath for the next episode of Catch Me a Killer to drop on the Showmax platform. And I'll be back with you next week to take another deeper look at these cases.